good, then, yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back to the RTS podcast. It's been a long time since I've, I've done this podcast. Uh, I can't even remember when. I think it was Dawn of War 3 First Impressions, so that would have been back in December or something. Uh, uh, yeah, I've been quite busy doing other things, mainly working for Stardock, and I've I've always been keen to venture back to the, the RTS discussions, and here we are today. Today I've got two um, people in the gaming community, Darren Total War, uh, a.k.a. Republic of Play. Hello and welcome. Hey, yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, a colleague of mine now also working for Stardock is Melte. Melde, Cheers. something like that. Some crazy Danish Melde, name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there's there's two things that we were planning on discussing today. And the reason why uh, so this came to be is because I, I just stumbled upon Darren's uh, his video. He did it actually a few months ago, but I only watched it like a week ago. He was, it was an AMA that he made where he announced that he left Creative Assembly. And he was talking about his experience working there. And, and how that was different to his own private work as a, as a YouTuber. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting uh, divide, is this sort of this gap between uh, game studios and consumers and, and press and so forth. So we can go over that. But first, um, I'm guessing most of the people on my channel, and if this ends up getting posted on Stardock, then there as well, they're not going to know who, who you are. So if you want to give us a little bit of info about yourself, Darren. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, all right, so very quickly, I guess, as quick as possible, without boring people. Um, basically, I'm from Ireland, and I went to college in Ireland for game development. And at the end of my four-year course of game development and programming and stuff, um, I started making videos about... Oh, I got I, I bought a big PC, because I, I had an internship as a programmer somewhere, and I got my first paychecks. Used to be a console gamer before then, although I did play some PC games. Um, like Total War and some RTS games mainly. But as soon as I got the money to get my own PC, I invested heavily in, in my own PC and was uh, getting excited for Total War Rome 2 that came out. Uh, when that came out, I wasn't quite too happy with it and uh, I kind of made some videos about it from a, kind of a game development perspective. It was, it was notorious for having like a, quite a, a buggy launch and uh, I kind of felt like I could look through some things and, and so figure out from a development perspective why things were happening I was like oh on the technical front I can see like what's going wrong here and the AI should be doing this when it's not blah 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 and things like that and it gained um, over the course of a year I suppose it gained a bit of traction and eventually I got around 4,000 subs or something like that and Creative Assembly the developer of the, of the of the game reached out to me and said hey like your videos do you want to come to the studio and see the next Total War and I was like yeah obviously that sounds awesome and I was kind of planning on like just going over there and just giving them my, my CV because I was just graduated at that point, hoping to get a job either as a programmer, designer, QA, anything. And uh, so, yeah, so I went over to them, saw saw their game, uh, turned out to be Attila, Total War Attila, and uh, then I ended up talking with the HR people and they were like, oh, we don't actually have any jobs going right now, but we'll keep you, you know, keep you on file, all that kind of stuff. So I, c I couldn't really get myself an interview. I was really just there as one of the YouTubers. There's a few others there as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, it went on and on for the next few months. They were sending me stuff early. I was going over. I went over to see them like three or four times, I think, in the space of six months. And then just before Attila came out, um, they basically offered me a job in their marketing department as like a an intern for creating videos. They were like, oh, we like your videos. You know, it's professional style or whatever. And um, they they asked to hire me. So I jumped at the chance and I went on for a six month internship with um, the marketing department of the community team and then a six month uh, QA internship, which is supposed to be leaning towards design, at least what they said. Um, but anyway, after the first six months of the internship, um, I was supposed to move over to this kind of QA position. And uh, they basically offered me the full time job as as like uh, a video producer, I guess, or a community manager, I think at the time. So I was like kind of torn in a way because I wanted to kind of go into the more development side of things. Um, but that was a little bit more unstable. There wasn't actually any open positions out of QA. I'm, I mean, there might have been six months later when I finished that internship or there might not have been. So I ended up just saying, I'll, t I'll take the job, the sec job security so that I'm okay and I can progress. And maybe later 
you know, it's a pretty open company. If you really want to push into something and you know, you know, you get talking to people and you can show that you're good at it, I was sure that like I could still push into other stuff if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, took the full-time job. Then over the course of two years, I spent two and a half years there. Over the course of two years, I stayed in that job. I got a couple of promotions, did pretty good, became kind of like a mini lead for a team of video uh, producers. I kind of ran their YouTube channel and, and made some videos for it. Always focused on gameplay and, and showing off the gameplay of the studio and things like that. And uh, really enjoyed actually what I did day to day. But just over time, um, it's like my favorite series. So just over time, it kind of, uh, I just didn't really like some of the decisions, I guess, that, that, that they were making. And, you know, it's their, it's their company or whatever. So I just ended up saying that, like, I wanted to leave um, and just go back to YouTube to being, like, more critical of the series because, at least in my opinion, it's, it's very um, uh, specific to Total War, but just the way that, that game has been progressing over the last few years, uh, it's just been something that I personally don't really agree with and I don't really like, didn't really like the idea of, like, oh, I'm helping sell this game I don't quite believe in. And uh, I much preferred it when I was a YouTuber and, it seemed like I was actually able to make a change or make a difference from the outside because I'd post things and they'd literally react to it on Facebook and then come out trying to like do better and the game kept doing better and I felt like I was part of a community of people that were like trying to help the game be become better and the series as well and now then when I got hired I felt like there wasn't really anybody left doing that there was no real reviews most of the time when they send people stuff or I was a guy who would actually send other YouTubers things um, they just make like let's plays and very enthusiastic commentaries about what they were getting um, instead of like more critical stuff. So I just felt like, I don't know, there isn't really a voice out there, at least in the Total War scene, that was that critical of it. I think there's one or two YouTubers maybe now um, that, that are. And I just kind of got a little bit fed up of, of just uh, working for them, I guess. Even though my day to day was actually quite fun, people I met were great um, and everything like that, I just think the kind of overall direction and you know, some things that the higher-ups might think I wasn't quite happy with, I guess. Um, trying to be <laughs> safe with what I say, I guess. Um, so, yeah, so that's pretty much everything. So I've been six months out of the job now. I was there for two and a half years, almost three. And uh, I went back to re rebrand my YouTube channel. It was called Darren Total War, like you said at the beginning, but now it's called Republic of Play. I moved away from the Total War name. Not They didn't quite ask me to, but they kind of mentioned that it's just kind of tricky that you used to work for us and some people might still associate you with us and it's our trademark or whatever. They didn't tell me to get rid of it, but I knew it was for the best to, to move on from that name. And now I'm branching into more more than just Total War. And, you know, I'm trying to review all these other games, all these other RTS games or strategy games or hardcore games in general that require a lot of time investment. So I think that's pretty much everything for the last like five years, basically. Well, that was a pretty intense answer. Yeah, <laughs> I sort of always have this this little worry that, man, what if I get someone on and they're not very talkative, and uh, so, oh no, man, <laughs> I'm very talkative. Sorry. So yeah, lots to lot to unpack there. Um, Malford, mm -hmm. you want to give a brief little introduction about what it is you do for Startup? Yeah, sure. It's it's not going to be as long. Uh, <laughs> Mine I, won't. I either. haven't been. Yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, I have a background in in communication and uh, i worked a lot with uh, professional football so uh, it's, it wasn't really in the cards to get into the game industry but uh, uh, last year I, I did some videos on youtube and i really wanted to do to work with video essays and this kind of a short documentary style and you know i got into contact with callum and uh, he mentioned at some point that that uh, or we talked about Company of Heroes and, you know, nerded on about that. But um, at some point, uh, you mentioned that there, there might be some marketing openings in, in Stardock and, and my format would fit there. So I uh, I got into contact with Stardock and, and um, from from then I've been trying to, to, you know, like incorporate this kind of video essay, talkative style of videos into uh, Stardock's YouTube channel. So now I, I'm, I'm basically... Uh, managing the the starter youtube channel um and what what follows from that yeah that's basically it i've been working there for i don't know uh half a year maybe maybe a bit less yeah yeah so i feel like we're in a similar boat where we i guess well darren was studying um game design but at least malta and i mm -hmm. we, we didn't really see ourselves entering 
the games industry and we just sort of ended up getting plucked up because of what we were doing um yeah, whether yeah, it's yeah. our you know youtube content and such so just briefly for me i was making youtube videos i still am uh and in particular not just rts shoutcast i was also doing like video essays talking about rts design doing reviews for various rts games and brad the the ceo of stardock watched my videos and he, he liked the uh the video essays the series was called what makes rts games fun where i would take yeah. a certain component of rts design such as micromanagement or asymmetric design and I'll, I'll unpack that and talk about how to do it well and how not to do it and um yeah brad just emailed me was like hey you know i like your videos here's a bunch of keys for ashes of the singularity which is coming out soon at escalation at the time and now i'm yeah working on on ashes um not as not only just as a d developer but also i get you know doing marketing stuff too and like community management it's a pretty broad role um but yeah one thing that i, I wanted to i guess respond to is uh mm. Well, something that actually made me laugh when, when Darren first said this in his, in his video was the, the, the sort of when most developers do like a gameplay stream, it's just awful. It's like a, a cringy, over-the-top excitement, like, wow, this is so exciting. And, and it's made yeah. by some community uh, manager that like has never really played the game before and it's very obvious that they haven't played the game and it just comes across as really fake and really disingenuous. Um, and, and I think what's really important is you got to actually establish trust with gamers mm. and, and w when, it, when that sort of content is so put on and it's so forced, it, it, it makes me lose respect for, uh, for their ability to make something that's, that's actually well balanced, well put together. They understand what they're doing because a lot of times the intentions of a developer, of a designer, you know, is something that sounds nice, but in theory, it just doesn't end up working that way when, when it actually gets played by real people. And so then when you, when you see these, these dev streams and they just have no idea what they're doing, it, it really doesn't put a good image across. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's especially true with, at least in my experience, the people that watch those kind of streams or watch developer streams are usually the extremely clued in hardcore players that know exactly what they're seeing. So you you can't it's not just about even knowing what you're doing it's you know these are people that have probably played the game like quite a lot so you're trying to show them things that they you know they already probably understand 90 percent of what they're seeing they're trying to see something new or something more involved or something that they don't know so it's super obvious obviously when you're like oh this person doesn't even really play this game that often but even it can even go further where even like myself even at times a huge total war fan if i if I didn't keep up with what the latest DLC was for whatever reason, if I was busy and I didn't know about like, I don't know, particular units or things like that, um, or whatever it may have been, a bit of the lore for Warhammer or something, you know, it gets called, called out really quickly. People do see it because they're, they're watching because they're that one, the group of 1000 people out of the million sales that know, that want to see what's coming next, like as early as possible. You're very rarely going to be marketing to someone at least on Twitch, if you're talking about live streams, very rarely going to be showing your game off to someone that does like is going to be more casual or just plays it a few hours or something like that. Uh, especially on these like company live streams. If you're a YouTuber, you can get away with it a bit more because you're just like, hey, I'm playing the game, just like you'll be playing the game. But the people that are like watching company live streams are like really into, you know, seeing the minutia of the gameplay. And uh, yeah, I just wish I, I think the great streams are always when you have a community manager and a designer. Designer can usually fill in lots of information about like what the, and they're usually quite eager to talk about you know what they've worked on and, and the minutiae of the gameplay uh, details whereas then the community manager can kind of just like read the chat keep the stream like entertaining i guess and and maybe pick the designer's brain for the most interesting things at least that's how i think it should be done anyway hmm. yeah, yeah i i agree but i i think even sometimes the designers themselves don't even really know how the game works and it's uh, in terms of playing it at any competent level and it's because i think it's it's easy for like a designer to have these ideas and think like oh this is really cool yeah but then mm. to actually play, especially when it comes to multiplayer games with a very high skill cap we're talking about rts games which are very challenging competitive yeah. games 
um, I, I feel like a, in so, so many times you just see designers playing it and that they're obviously not very good either and that doesn't fill me with very confidence. But do you think, do you think Darren, that it's actually worth it for developers to put out streams themselves and invest the energy in that because people on YouTube are doing it, right? Um, well, he's muted. Oh. My bad, sorry, Gosh. I had my push to talk back way, uh, the wrong way around. Um, yeah, from my perspective, it's something I, I thought about as well. Like, is there any point of doing these live streams? It takes up a lot of time. The, the developers are kind of on edge a lot of times if they're going to be on the streams and stuff. I think mm. I think YouTubers do a pretty good job of it. And you can easily find ones that are just going to be enthusiastic about your game. Um, so, mm. but I, I do like watching developer live streams. Like I watch, I think Paradox do a really great job of that. Um, mm. They've got, like I said, uh, community and developers on it, and sometimes their CEO is on their li live streams. They just and they always seem to know like what they're talking about. You can you can tell like their community manager or producers don't know as much, but that's why they usually have a developer on and they guide them through things. And they're usually a good back and forth um, that I find. So I, I like those streams and Paradox has been super successful with them. They have thousands of people watch their streams, mm. even though their games um, maybe, like I always compare it to Total War just because that's where I worked, but uh, they used to do way better on their streams than we did on our streams in terms of viewership. And I was always mm. confused, well not confused, but it was always an interesting debate within our studio because we had way more sales. So it was kind of like, why can't we get as many people as they do? Like, what's what's going on? Like, we sell more than they do every game. So mm. why are they so strong with their community team? And I, I think it's because they have developers on. They know what they're talking about. It's very rare that I've ever seen them struggle, as you say. Um, and I have seen other studios or other companies where it is like, with Company of Heroes 2 as an example, where one of their community managers was really friendly and great, but you could tell he just doesn't really play the game. And mm. as well with the designer. I think they might be really good systems level designers but when it comes to actually playing in micro in units and stuff it gets a bit overwhelming for them so they might know how to design the core gameplay quite well but that doesn't mean that they're going to be the ones that are quite fast and know all the like really deep intricacies of the game because that kind of comes out with the community as the game evolves over time at least i've found but mm. yeah it's weird the way designers aren't like often at least in my experience aren't actually that good i don't know why mm. i feel like if i, I was one i would be <laughs> Yeah, we talk about paradox and and I think that what they're really good at and and their games are a bit special because they are different from other games, right? They really um, they take a lot more time to master and play and master. So I think that the paradox community um, they have this kind of um, cult quality to it, and not in a bad way necessarily, but they are people who are like massively engaged because they have played yeah. the game so much and so the paradox ceo uh, i can't remember his name um he, he, yes exactly he also said that paradox games are kind of like a lifestyle to people <laughs> right it's like what you do uh, some people i think the quote is some people um they go windsurfing and some people they go do something else well some people play paradox games right yeah so yeah. it's kind of when when you develop games for this kind of niche you can you can people get so engaged because it's basically their lifestyle and i don't think uh Stardock has that uh cult like a community and right. not creative assembly either um I, I don't know why maybe it's not as niche um but they don't have yeah. that tight a connection with their community their games take up an extremely long amount of hours to, you know, yeah, investment paradox, for the yeah. players. So that that's that could be part of it, you know. If, the, if you're going to be playing a paradox game and get involved with it, probably spending hundreds of hours on it. Yeah. Um, well, you basically so. need to watch YouTube videos if you want to play a paradox yeah. game, right? <laughs> I think it's reflected in their DLC as well. Like they've got like a lot of DLC. Some people find it annoying or controversial or whatever, but um. That's very. That just shows like people are buying it like over and over and over again. They probably stick with CK2 because there's like a steady stream of content, and mm. uh, they just put thousands of hours into it. EU4 yeah. and all those games. Yeah. I any think, think any it, game sorry. where you, it takes so long to play, like MOBAs are probably the best example of cult-like communities, because you're investing thousands of hours and hundreds of dollars. You know, often if you're buying all these skins mm. and such that. You, you get very attached. You, you want to make sure that you've invested the 2,000 hours on the, the correct MOBA 
so you get very like territorial when it's like no 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 yeah. no Dota is the best MOBA and it's like they're yeah. both they're both fine but you you want to feel yeah. like you're you're in this only I discovered the master race MOBA and because yeah. uh, if I didn't that cognitive dissonance of I wasted two thousand hours playing the wrong MOBA is too much yeah exactly it's too much for you and also but I uh, so looking at paradox I think that talking about the divide between gamers and and game studios. I think you should you should look at, at Paradox not as they have a community, but more as a company that acts as it is a society. You know that that it's not really that they manage the community; it's more that people live in this Paradox universe. You know, so so it doesn't it it's fine for people to criticize, for example, Paradox games. It doesn't mean that they're not fans because they still live in the in the Paradox universe, right? So, I think we'll see more of this also that that gamers are so invested in the games and the companies especially that the building of trust will be like the most important asset for for a company you know that they can continually yeah. deliver new content that people trusts well one of the first streams i saw with them was for their game stellaris before it came out and they had their ai programmer on it who who's now the game director actually and then they had a, a marketing man or a community video person i guess and uh, they just had such a good like back and forth and they both hit him knowing about the game in such detail and being able to explain it and they show their game pretty early like they tell you there's going to be bugs there's going to be you know all these problems and and placeholder art it's what they call hot code and they're very used to showing that stuff off now it was just so different to anything i'd seen at least at that point mm. typically i'd never seen a company willing to show off uh, bugs and and issues just so they can explain features to people and then laugh about them you know, at least yeah. in the in the culture that I was in, it was like if if you show a bug, like we have to have a discussion about it afterwards and and yeah. talk about like how that shouldn't ever happen again and stuff. Yeah, you know? I think that's changed just, now it, yeah. you, in terms of the the early access sort of culture. You know, PUBG, yeah. like people bugs aren't a deal breaker necessarily. So, and just this <laughs> this early access, um, you know, beta has become not so much beta it's become a demo right like you don't get demos anymore you get betas instead so that that's certainly something that i think has changed is that yeah. more companies are willing to show footage earlier on which i think is is for the better but i think that's also yeah. something that we've been doing pretty well at startock is that we have people who know what they're doing stream so i'll i'll stream and i'll do, do a lot of youtube videos for ashes where there was like a shout cast of multiple um, players or whether it's me playing through a, a campaign mission and then so you get the perspective of like i made this mission or you know i'm i have this high level understanding of the game because i'm a pretty competitive player of all rts games but of, of ashes of course mm, mm. um and i think people really appreciate those a lot more and i know brad mm. the ceo he does streams for galsiv 3 um in mm. when, yeah, when there's, uh, a, there's a really it's a really funny example of, of we have this humans versus the multiverse stream right now with Brad, and when Brad is playing, he's actually taking notes along the way on oh I need to write to people about it I need a short shortcut for this so, you know he's actually changing changing the game along the way mm, yeah. not to not to make too much of, of a commercial here for that but but yeah I think that's the way things are going you know uh, yeah I think um, at least just from Creative Assembly and maybe some other AAA companies' perspectives is where they feel if they're not doing early access and maybe they've had a game or two in the past that's had a buggy launch or something, they might be still adverse to, you know, oh, if we show bugs, people might remember like how our game came out a bit buggy and we had to patch it a few times and stuff. But I think you're right. They are, you know, they might be the last ones to change now, but they are coming around, I think, where it's like... Mm especially when it comes to just like even additive content like DLC it's like yeah there's going to be a few few bugs just like a month before release but typically they don't really have any on release you know especially like the games established like these bugs are usually very minor and a lot mm. more companies not just these two that I'm mentioning do do start are starting to um show that stuff off cuz they're just like we want to feed the community like some interesting features talk about the gameplay you know that like there's some art missing or whatever it's fine like that's going to be there and yeah. uh, I think people are pretty under like can understand that, and no one's going to be. But it's it's even a positive for, for people, that. you know. They they feel involved. Yeah. Um, well, I think it goes back to building trust, like you guys were saying yeah. earlier. It's like we're willing to show you this stuff early, so that you can just see what the game is like, and it's just like an open conversation. It's like, yeah, it's a little bit early, and 
you know, we know what we're showing you and stuff. So I think it just goes back to the, the trust and people react to that and see that it's a good thing. And that's why they want to watch a lot of the time, Yeah, I think. So was there any other um, weird things that you've encountered when you started working at Creative Assembly and there were things that the marketing people or your developers would say and you're like, hold up, that's that's strange? Um, I don't know. That's quite a broad question. Um, I think... I think one of the things that I didn't really expect too much just when I joined is is how how few people actually like play the game, um, and that's because like there's a few reasons for that. Some people, some of them might be huge fans, but as soon as they start working on the project, and I I know a few people like same age as me, same enthusiasm for Total War before they joined, and they don't play it anymore just because it's the game they work with. And when you work with the game, not mm -hmm. just on the marketing level, when you're actually working and you can see how the game works kind of behind the scenes. Um, you kind of know how to game the game a lot because you're working with it so closely. So I find that a lot of people there like don't, and not, not everyone has to play the game. I would say artists and things don't really need to play the game. Designers should be very familiar with it and marketing I think should be familiar with it. But um, I was just surprised at how I, I thought, not to go on and on, but um, when I was in college, I was looking for other people that were interested in like strategy games, couldn't really find any. Uh, same when I was growing up in, in high school or whatever. It was kind of my niche that no one seemed to like enjoy as well. I liked Total War when I was growing up. I liked Age of Empires, and uh, I got really got into Company Furios and things later. Couldn't find anyone except eventually through the internet that people would want to play with me. So I thought, awesome! I'm joining Creative Assembly, this amazing strategy game studio, it's a company I've always wanted to work at. I'm gonna make tons of friends that play RTS games, and I basically made one that plays these kind of games. Most people there I know play just like your average. It's just your average gamer. It's like oh, I'll play MOBAs or I'll play whatever ha it happens to be. So I was just surprised, like, oh, that, you know, when I joined, there's not many people actually shared the enthusiasm for this series that I do. Um, it was, I guess, a little disappointing, but uh, I think now, on, on hindsight, it's actually not that surprising. There's like 500 people there. Not everyone's going to be a hardcore fan of this series or whatever. They just want a job in the games industry and maybe want to move to where they want to be later on, you know? I guess I it's a consequence. Just, I just got lucky. I guess it's a consequence of the game industry being so competitive that like if, if you want to be a programmer or an artist, you have to dedicate all of your time to honing your skills and, and just being really competent so that if, mm. if, you, if you're also spending all of this time playing games, then it's going to be hard for you to be competitive to, compared to someone yeah. else of the same profession who just focuses more entirely on that. So, so I can understand someone who goes to work works on... Uh, whatever they work on they don't want to necessarily go home and then play that game like they might want to do something mm -hmm. else or just play a different game or have a different experience so i think that's why a lot of people fall out of playing what they work on um but there's yeah. also there's also um, a difference in, in in interest you know like there could be because so for example when when i worked in in football or uh, soccer if you're american uh, when i work with football like i i like to coach uh, children right uh, but I worked in a professional football club, but not everybody can work on, you know, the, the, the high level teams or, but yeah, yeah. so, so your interests, they, uh, they differ, right? So maybe someone likes to design art for a game, but doesn't like the game itself. It, yeah. it's, it's not that really big a problem if you're a big corporate uh, game developer, yeah. right? And of course, you all all the three of us we all come from youtube and and on the marketing side so and and we like to play the games so i, I can understand your um experience or your uh, that you were uh, shocked to see when you came to creative yeah. assembly um, i think as well like it doesn't actually impact it's not like i'm saying it impacts their performance of, of how they work either i think it's no. largely it's fine especially when it comes to like artists and things like that they don't need to have a love of the series to be able to make really good stuff for it and i think their enthusiasm is still super high even if they're not you know it's not the dream game i guess they're working on they still are really they want to make something that they can be proud of and stuff so i don't think it actually impacts anything that that seriously it was just yeah it's just one thing i could think of that um yeah, when I joined, I was just like, oh, I thought there'd be like everybody would be into the game, I guess, but nobody really yeah. is. I got lucky, though, because it's the company I always wanted to work, and it was pretty much, bar another internship, it was pretty much the first company, I, my first game, real AAA games company. So I think I just like got lucky on that. Most people probably don't get there until they're like 30 or 40 or whatever when they work up the chain, uh, wherever they're based, because I just, geographically, I'm lucky as well because I'm right next to it. So 
uh, being based in yeah. Ireland. Yeah, getting headhunted is is certainly makes the process a lot easier. I, I think one <laughs> one one thing that I noticed, um, not just with Stardock, but sort of with with all companies in general, is I, I think there's the inside of a game studio, they they feel like they really need to innovate. They feel like they need to have this new unique crazy thing that totally has its own unique spot in the market and whereas a lot of times what is the most successful isn't something that's new or unique or innovative it's something that's just Mm. really solid it's something that's really well refined it's really well polished um and it just it just works well the example that i like to use is if you look in the rts market what are the two most popular rts games and so it's by far it's starcraft 2 and age of empires 2 and those are both really old rts games starcraft 2 is you know seven or eight years old now but it's Mm -hmm. it's it's very similar to starcraft 1 which is from the 90s age of empires 2 of course is about 2000 and as far as gameplay there's nothing unique or innovative about them They're, they're very generic rts games in terms of the mechanics and such um and yet they're completely unsurpassed in terms of the level of depth and complexity and just how well balanced and designed it is it's such a a, a solid experience and I, and I like to really look at that and, and think you know if we want to make a really successful rts game and say we make a sequel to, to some other franchise say there's a new command and conquer game it doesn't have mm. to be this all these have these new systems and update all these things it just has to be good and deliver experience that people are familiar with um starcraft 2 you know it was very similar to starcraft 1 it's a bit harder to compare like a game from the 90s to a modern game because rts has evolved so much but say from 2005 to 2018 rts Mm. hasn't evolved and if you're wanting to make a sequel to say again command and conquer I, i don't think it needs to actually innovate it just needs to be solid I think you're you you onto something here that um so games are definitely a very new genre, right? But if you look at at, for example, books or <laughs> some other technology, uh, when when people read books, it's usually something that they have read before, you know, like I, I read so if you read crime novels or something, like I don't read crime myself, but I know a lot of people that does. They read another crime book and another and another, right? And it's, it's they have recurring it's, archetypes. Yeah, it's it's the same structure and it's going back to that kind of lifestyle thing that paradox leverages is that people have this kind of lifestyle that they want the games to fit into, right? And it, it needs to look like something that they can, I don't know, like l- live with, you know, and, and do every day. So, um, yeah, I think you're right that game companies have a tendency to think about themselves as very innovative and, and coming up with new and, and very... Uh, something that is that people have to be surprised about or or graphics that are extremely uh, better than last year but really what what you see now is uh, that it's if you look at paradox for example that this trust development over time with the same content or the same content again and again uh, with small differences works works much better in in getting people to come back yeah, I agree. I think there's um, a couple of reasons that it might happen, though. If you think of, um, it's not a strategy game, but I'm just going to make the comparison. Something like a Star Wars Battlefront. It's like everyone always says they just wanted the old, kind of the old game, but to look really good and stuff yeah. like that. I think if you're a designer, a lot of a lot of designers don't want to just make, they want to they want to innovate to show off their skill. I'd be like, Oh, I'm able to design something that's completely new that people like on top of like an old franchise. It's like I don't know who the lead designer of Battlefront was or Dawn of War 3 or whatever, but I bet they felt that they can't just make, you know, Dawn of War 2.5 even though that's really what everyone wanted. Well, it's they like wanted Dawn of want... War 1.5 is what they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So it's like, yeah, we just want kind of what we had before but maybe with, you know, more maybe more streamlined UI or something and a better competitive ladder for people to play multiplayer and stuff like that. Some customization, maybe. But instead, they're like, oh, instead, you know, we're going to throw in, like, this kind of, like, hero system in a way. Or with Battlefront, they're going to be like, well, we're going to, I don't know, 
cut single player or whatever they de designed to do or they kind of streamlined the gameplay in battlefront at least down to be like doesn't matter if you jump doesn't matter if you crouch your aim will always be the same things like that and ma that maybe that was casualifying it or whatever um but I bet there's like a, a, a reason that a designer might think, I don't want to just build on what's already there. I want to make my own mark and uh, develop it further. And I, I reckon there's also a marketing issue as well, where they're like, well, we can't, it's very difficult to market the same thing that people have already. Although you could spin it where it's like, it's the game you love, but coming back, it's kind of what Call of Duty World War II did. Yeah. I, mean, I don't play either of those games I've just mentioned, but um, hmm. it's kind of what they were doing. They were like, oh, it's back to the roots you know back to your roots boots on the These ground are great before boots on the ground <laughs> these games are great before and they're going to be great again and uh wasn't the case i guess but um <clears throat> i think it's a, it creates a marketing issue and i bet the designers don't want to just rehash what's already out there even though i do agree that most people or most people that play strategy games or rts games especially tend to be older than around over 20 years old and want kind of what they they grew up with um, because there isn't many games that just do a solid competitive game like that. And you can see even the remaster of Age of Empires HD or whatever, too. Um, sold like 4 million copies or something. And you know, that's only, I don't know, four years old now on Steam. So it's like there is a market for it. I don't know why. And the, even the DLCs sold really well for it. So they know there's a market for this like older style of gameplay. So hopefully that those sales ring through to, um, to Relic Studios now, I guess, and Microsoft, the publisher, and they... <laughs> They don't feel like they have to like introduce some crazy new feature for Age of Empires 4 and just be like, let's just take everything that was good, try to find any little niggles that people had about maybe whatever the multiplayer and how that works or whatever features and try to phase them out if we can, but retain like what's really, really good. I think that's all they need to do. They don't need to introduce any crazy new features or anything like that. Um, and then it, it would be good. I mean, it's a safer route as well, I think. Yeah, I hope Relic have learned their lessons from Dawn of War 3. And even looking at other genres, what's the most successful FPS? I mean, it might now be PUBG, but more consistently, it, it's Counter-Strike, CSGO. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess Call of Duty 2. But, but in terms of like a longevity of play base, it's got what I'm getting at, not so much just like mm. raw sales. So the Counter-Strike. And, and the Counter-Strike sequels are so similar. They, they barely change anything. It's... Mm. It's mostly, I mean, people are going to hate me, but it's mostly cosmetics in, in terms of yeah. like updated yeah. graphics and stuff. But you get all the CS people that are like, oh, actually in uh, CS Source, the hitboxes were really bad. It's like, come on, dude. Like most yeah, people don't so they, know. They, they change hitboxes and, and a few things like that where, you know, guns used to poke through walls. They don't do that anymore. So they just tightened and refined the experience that was there already, I think. They haven't introduced a new economy or, or a new feature to it, to the game or anything like that in, in the mm. gameplay. But yeah, I think the, the marketing concern is probably the main reason why this happens because th it, it's a lot easier from, from the marketing side of things to have this pitch, even if mm -hmm. e even if the gameplay consequence isn't actually good. So the, the best example of this uh, that's relevant to us at Stardock, because Ashes of the Singularity is similar to this um, in terms of its gameplay, is Planetary Annihilation. When, when that was in Kickstarter, it had this massive marketing gimmick of the, you can smash asteroids into planets. And it had this yeah. this uh, this really cool sounding and cool looking like interplanet uh, gameplay. I don't really know how it worked, but supposedly you could, mm -hmm. you're fighting on a planet and then you could like go to a nearby moon or a nearby asteroid and you could fling that towards the planet and, and all this stuff that just sounds epic, but... Um, it it was awful. Like I didn't actually play it, but it just everyone I know has just said that it sucked hard, uh, and it yeah. had this the way that the, the 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 combat worked. Well, just the 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 whole map is that you're actually fighting on a spherical planet. It's not a flat two dimensional mm -hmm. map like every other RTS game. And again, it sounds cool, but it just makes it's really jarring. It's really sort of yeah, disorienting. It's yeah, it's yeah. it's even a bit nauseating when you when you're not used to it. And so it's mm. this thing that. The marketing worked, and you know they had a really successful Kickstarter, and I think they sold a lot of copies at launch. But everyone hated that game. Like, you know, supposedly Titan is a lot better now, but certainly the the default Planetary Annihilation um, mm. was not a well received game. And so I think that's maybe where this comes from. And 
and perhaps something that I'm still not as clued into as I'm not really a full marketing person is that the mm. like how much of the game's design is dictated by marketing because obviously as gamers we we just want a good game we, that's all we care about but you know the company obviously has to make money and sell copies and if compromising the gameplay is going to create a better marketing angle then they may have to do that and i'm sure they wouldn't do that intentionally or, or maybe they will like you don't know so I, I think that's perhaps where the crux of this comes from like i if you look at company of heroes 2 when that came out the marketing was all about the cold tech the general winter you know you had the the blizzard Lizard. the yeah. deep snow <laughs> the freezing and, and again it's, it sounds really cool and there's a lot of videos you can do about it and you then you, you played it and it sucked. Like the freezing was frustrating. It slowed and stagnated the game down. Deep Snow meant that you couldn't interact with core gameplay mechanics. That you couldn't dodge grenades because you moved too slowly. So it was just horrific. It ended up removing it from ranked play, um, which, you know, credit yeah. to them. Um, so, yeah, I think that's perhaps where a lot of this comes from. Uh, I think it's... um. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's a studio base. I think it varies from studio to studio, whether the design came first and then the marketing said how they're going to market the game. Like with Planetary Annihilation, they, that might have been the vision for the game. Like we want to be able to fling moons at places we want the place to be, or we want planets to be spherical and you move, you planet hop around. And then marketing were like, okay, those are your bullet point features. So we're going to like do them to death in the marketing. Similar with Company of Heroes, I bet. I don't know, but I, I would imagine a designer thought like, yeah, Cold tech will be cool. It gives the people, it gives a chance for people to, the blizzard rolls in and people get a chance to rebuild. So you can't just get wiped out super quick. There's a, you know, it's probably something like that. That was the initial idea, and the, and then the thematic, you know, Russian side of the war and the cold, you know, the the winters and stuff like that, probably is what marketing latched onto because that's something new. It wasn't in the previous game, so it's like, hey, this is something new. Now, was that put in? Was something like that put it put in because it's so marketable? That's, I guess, the, the question. I don't. I guess we won't know. But in my experience, at least um, at a few different studios, it, it tends to be design first, and then marketing pick what they can from the design to talk about. And they don't know if it's going to be good or not because it, hmm. the game's not out yet or done. But they're like, this is the big new thing. This sounds cool. Whether it be throwing an asteroid into a planet or cold tech or or whatever. So I would like to think in a perfect world that marketing doesn't influence games too much or dictate at such a massive design as as you know a cold tech or something like that i think they just pick something that they can not really knowing if it's going to be good or not uh just because it's different to what they were marketing before and then use that to drive home the point of hey this is like totally new this is like what you should be looking at and stuff yeah i was specifically more referring to why game companies over innovate when i'm like why do companies innovate so much and perhaps yeah the marketing mm. reasons why but um oh, i lost my train of thought well, like like i said i think it could be the designers themselves just want to innovate you know i don't know if, how you feel about it but if you were making a game would you, would you want to be do you think you just want to make the same game that's been made before but just slightly better yes or would you want to make yeah <laughs> yes I, I, I would what? i mean there's a giant I mean, banner I, behind me like command and conquer general i guess you can't see it on the sky. Yeah. <laughs> command and conquer generals the zero hour like i would remaster that I would nerf Humvees. I guess, I guess the, I would, you know. I guess the question is like, why why remake a game if you can just play the game? Like, why remake Age of Empires 2? You still have it. It's still there. People do still play it. Like, what's the point? Just well, you know, playing devil's advocate, I guess. So obviously, graphics is a big deal. Like, what? Why? Why do people play CS:GO? Why do people well, not CSGO play Counter Strike? CS:GO doesn't look particularly Source? good. Well, it looks well, better than Source. Doesn't CSGO it? CSGO has the hitbox things and you know it's like you can't stick your gun through a wall you can't like glitch jump and stuff like that so why isn't everyone just playing battlefield one i mean that's the best looking shooter on the, like that there is pretty much um but people do play csgo csgo does not in my opinion look that good it looks no, better it than the one that came before of course um yeah and i agree if you have the exact same game but one's game's graphics are better that game wins because it's graphics are better it's, it's also just like the that. the hype in the community people will always flock to what's new yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you look at the Call of Duty games, I mean they're all the same, right? Like they don't they're no different to each other. And Basically, yet yeah. the the most active one is obviously going to be the latest one. So mm-hmm. um but also people sort of want change, you know, like I'm sure mm-hmm. e- even mm-hmm. though people love Age of Empires 2 to death, 
you'd think they would be interested to play something that's different and fixes some of the problems with it. Um, yeah. They, but there's also... There's... Sorry, Go. sorry, Cal. No, but I, I, I just think that there's also... Um, so what we're talking about is basically what does change mean in a game, right? So, for example, I, I have a friend that says um, he doesn't buy the next Call of Duty game. He waits four games and then he buys that game because then right. it has changed enough for him to uh like <laughs> it's changed enough for him to put money on it you know like now it's a new game but really i don't think that's true you know it's it's, it's just it's still kind of the same game but as a game company of course you want to, you want to change something you all you also want to give people the appearance of something has changed for them to uh invest their time and and money in it like it's it like let's not fool ourselves you need both things right you need you need to be recognizable and you also need it to be new i guess it's just the curse of being a game developer right and yeah. every and every other uh, industry also has this problem when they're selling a new product right yeah i'd agree with that i mean like i said i, I don't envy the position of relic right now because they no. need to <laughs> they, they're working on one of the greatest you know, RTS franchise of all time, essentially, uh, mm. super, super high pressure. And then coming off of what I would consider a, f a failed game before that, I cannot have made that much money. Um, I, I would go with train wreck personally. <laughs> yeah. So that they, they got to decide how, like, the, like how much do they change that can draw in enough people without affecting the core experience of the game. I mean, it mm. sounds easy to sit back and say like, just make the same game as age of empires Two, play it pretty safe and make it look really nice, make it look run smooth. I think, yeah, an Age of Empires 2 essential clone will be brilliant with better graphics, and all they need to do is maybe improve the multiplayer kind of systems and community around that, maybe throw in some aesthetics if people want to play with mm. that. Because, you know, Age of Empires just has, like, a pretty standard lobby system. You know? It doesn't really have a proper... Darren, how, how, would you, how would you like... How would you like the, and I'm also asking you, Callum, how would you like the, the, the community to, how, how can I say it? How much should the community be able to influence games? And and how like how would a dream relationship between a, a studio and its audience or and critics be? Well, I, I don't know if you necessarily need a lot of community people, but you, I think you need a lot of testers, a lot of people who are playing really, really early alpha builds. Because mm -hmm. I guess if we if we go back to the cult, the whole cold tech thing is, even if the the cold tech was entirely just for fun gameplay reasons, if you have thousands of of games being played, in in early Company of Heroes two alpha, there'd be a consensus that says cold tech really sucks, and then they would they would change it and they they wouldn't have that. I don't think that's necess necessarily true though. I don't think that's necessary. Well, true. at that point, they probably would have invested so much that they, they wouldn't have a choice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, yeah. okay, maybe not so drastically, but, but in terms of, yeah, like changing the system. So I think you need to have a, a lot of outside, not, even, even if they're community members, but they're sort of like, you know, they're under a non-disclosure agreement or whatever. I think you need a lot of people testing stuff because the, the designers and the developers, they won't have the time to have the meticulous playing and testing and, and really f seeing viscerally, is this actually fun? It sounds fun, but is it actually fun? And do these systems, do they actually work the way that they are intended? Because again, often the way that things are intended don't shape out. Um, so yeah, I, I think certainly testing is important. And I know some companies are, are doing that as they're getting community members in in like mm. NDAs and, and testing stuff early. Yeah, I think it's a really tricky problem though because um, yeah, I, I work at Creative Assembly when I worked there, they they have a, a kind of a secret group of people that are under NDA that aren't YouTubers or anything like that that they send send the game early. And there's a, there's a lot of them and they're like considered, you know, of the most hardcore players. And they'll, they'll play stuff early, really early and give feedback all the time. And I think it, they are quite a valuable group um but there comes a point where you have to like almost stop listening to them in a way because they're so they can be so skewed to one particular thing that it can actually mm. affect the game in a negative way for most people um mm. and ex uh, i'm trying to think of an example 
they, they have a game coming up called Total War Arena. Okay, it's like a free to play multiplayer only version of Total War, and uh, that game has been like in development for four. I would call it development hell at this point. It's been in development for like four years, actually probably longer. It's been playable for four years, and it's still not out yet. I think they've announced that they're going to release it soon, and. Mm -hmm. um, that's gone through so many iterations because they'll get all this feedback from the community that says like, hey, I want this to work this way. The developers react to that and then that causes another problem where they have to like react to that problem and then another one. And then they get com feedback again. And what I've seen through the updates, because you can play it in a beta state, is they'll introduce features then take them away, then reintroduce them and they're almost like identical, at least for me. And I play quite a lot. I might not be on the super high end hardcore spectrum of the competitive scene of that game. But I've seen their scoreboard system change like six or seven times. Their uh, like kind of abilities, like how you use abilities, change like six or seven times, and it kind of almost comes full circle. And they, they're super involved with the community. So mm -hmm. before three years ago, I would have completely agreed that get as many community in as possible as early as possible and listen to everything they say. But mm -hmm. I think it actually, you know, the people who made Age of Empires and StarCraft Two probably didn't do that at all back in the day. I think you just need like to know, like really good designers that know what they're doing and can commit yeah. to what they're doing but you do you should have testers come in or outside development and betas to help refine the mechanics of the game like mm. you said the cold tech thing would have come up and they probably could have rebalanced it instead of just having to like scrap it completely um maybe like yeah i don't know what they could have done but i'm sure they could have done something if they were gonna if they're adamant on keeping that feature or at the very um, least just not put it in ranked yeah something like that they're like this works great in single player you know, it's still the marketing still will hold up that way. And then in multiplayer, we know that we don't need to include this um, because we want a more refined experience. So I think betas and things like that are super helpful. But I think there does come a point where you have to, you can't, you need to just commit to like your design and you can't just go back and forth on. Because the problem, just really quickly, the problem with like a, a QA group or whatever, they don't necessarily think multiple steps ahead. They say, hey, I've got a problem. I need it to be fixed. This, this doesn't work how it should. Um, and they don't necessarily know what the ramifications or change of that would be further down the line. That's why you have a balance update for Company of Heroes 2 every month. Like they haven't, it's been what, three years and they haven't balanced the game properly yet? It's because they keep, they change one thing, someone else finds something else to do something else, and mm. it's like never mm. fixed. It's dynamic, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of reasons why that's a problem. But yeah, I yeah. think community feedback is very fickle. You have to take it for what it is. You, the way that I think mm. works is you need to have like a, a designer who has ultimate sort of authority in terms of what does and doesn't get changed. Uh, mm. And that person really needs to know what they're talking about. But yeah. that, that person's obviously flawed. And so when it comes to balancing things in ashes, um, you know, everything's all up to me. What I do is it's entirely my decision. But it is very useful to have people that suggest things that I just won't think about or... If I have yeah, an idea definitely. and it's actually a bad idea, you know, having someone that says like, no, nah, I don't agree with that. So I think you yeah. need to not have community and, and even like if it's other other devs as well. So there'll be something that ends up getting reverted because there's like other considerations. So say an example is um, one of the, the basic structures for the substrate faction. It, it, I made it to cost radioactive to make it more fair and more balanced. And that was fine, but the problem with it that I didn't actually think about until later on is because it was the first structure that uh, you, the player could build and use the secondary resource that you don't get straight away, even though you start with that resource, that the it was a noob trap where you'll have like new players that build three of them at once and then all of a sudden they can't afford it and they get they basically... An, an, unable to progress any further. Or the AI will, on, on certain... Um, like settings, like on low resource or whatever, then they wouldn't be able to do it properly because the AI would do too many things. So you need to have multiple people, whether it's community members or whether it's other devs, um, keeping you in check, you know, the whole George Lucas yeah. effect. Like you can't give one man ultimate power because obviously they'll make... I mean, you can't give one man ultimate... Um, you can't yeah, have their freedom. opinions unchecked, rather. Give them the mm. power, but have people that are willing to challenge them and suggest things. Um, mm. So, yeah, you, the community... Whereas if you have community that entirely dictate changes because you have a designer who doesn't actually understand the game at a deep enough level, they'll go, well, this is what everyone wants, so let's do that. Um, yeah. 
or, or e- e- even if it's it's say if it's, if it's democratically voted. So this is what Company of Heroes Two has done recently. Um, it, it, with some of their like changes in these patches, they, they've had to get things approved by polls, and mm. that's obviously bad for when you have like four v four players, which are the vast majority of players then voting against something which is such an incredible important change for one versus one and mm-hmm. everyone who plays 1v1 is like this is obviously a good change but the 4v4 people are like this is weird why are you doing this no i don't like it yeah and then and so you can have that that i guess the, the tyranny of the majority but then on on the flip side if you if you instead go okay hardcore like top 10 1v1 players only then you have people who are they have a very small domain of what they're actually concerned about, and so you know what's the way that it's it's done in one v one can be very different to four v four, and so if you have one v one players determining the design and the balance of the game, then that can um, you know screw over four v four, or like even certain pro players like how intensely micro demanding the sniper is and you'll have the pros that win tournaments based off of this one unit like no no this unit's fine don't change it but actually for most players it's horrific so again Mm. you 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 need to have a designer that has a wider perspective in terms of you know different types of player groups um that can take this feedback and then dismiss it or take it on board um you know generally the the truth lies somewhere in the middle when it comes to which is the best way to, to balance something, having yeah. all these different methods. I'm, I'm wondering where, where you see yourself in that role, uh, Darren, like as a critic, right? Uh, when you make videos for consumers, but you also make them for the developers. Uh, yeah. what, what do you see your own mission as being? <laughs> that's, that's difficult to, to s- summarize. It, uh, I find what do you want even... to do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I fi- well, I find it even difficult, like making a review or something, when you've got just as Callum described, like people on different ends of the scale. If someone, a really competitive high-end player of Company of Heroes Two, might think like, might think one way, and someone who's a bit more casual might think another way. And I'm definitely leaning towards more hardcore, but I'm I'm not at that level. Like I can't be at the moment. It's too much of a time investment, uh, to, if you want to hit multiple games. So I find it really difficult to actually review a game and, and then sp- to be able to speak authoritatively about whether or not something it feels balanced or feels good. Um, and then as well, like, yeah, when you're trying to like review things in terms of like how the designers are going to perceive that and, and stuff like that. So I don't know. Well, my mission at the moment, I guess, uh, for, for my YouTube channel, I just want to be able, I just want to review. It's pretty simple, really. I just want to review strategy games and like cast the uh, like. I guess show them off to people that might not be as interested in them if possible so i'm not aiming at a casual audience but i find uh, like strategy games especially not just rts games they can be quite overwhelming to get into for a lot of people and you need to spend a lot of time in them before you know if they're good or not uh, for a lot of people um so i basically like do the time for you and then tell you if i think it's worth your time and i try to even then just let you make your own decision by saying like here's the systems that are going to be at play this is how my experience of it, and now you can hopefully decide if it's for you or not. Um, mm. That's kind of the idea, because you might spend 100 hours in a Total War game or a Paradox game or Company of Heroes before you really know how everything kind of gels together and how it plays together and what the multiplayer is like and things like that. And it's super hard, for me at least, because I need to spend that amount of time before I can even make one video. So it's quite difficult to sustainably have an income <laughs> on YouTube doing that because it's just such a time investment with each game. Whereas if I did just play it for a few hours, I could probably say something about it, but I wouldn't necessarily know that much about it and be able to tell people really well, if you, hey, you, are you gonna like this game? Here's how it plays out in the end game. Here's how multiplayer works out. So it's difficult, it's a learning process at the moment. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to cut down my time invested in a game, but still be able to give all the information I think people need about it. Um, and that's roughly uh, basically what I'm doing at the moment. What I try to do with my reviews is um, tell people the perspective that you're coming from. So you'll say, mm. these are the games that I like. So, you know, coming from a Command & Conquer background, I was expecting Gregu to be more like this. Or if, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, in, in terms of, say, 8-bit armies, I'll say, 
it's trying to be like Command and Conquer, but Command and Conquer was good for these reasons, and this game does not replicate that. So I think the, yeah. more, the more context and the more perspective you can bring, that that's valuable either from the perspective of if someone aligns with you. So if someone says, well, I really like Dawn of War 2, he also really likes Dawn of War 2, so then I will take what he says seriously. Or on the inverse, where it's like, so this guy, say, the reviewer doesn't like this game, um, however, he likes games that I don't like, therefore, perhaps I will like this game, because it's the opposite of what we like normally. So, regardless of whether or not um, a viewer agrees with you, so long as you, you, you're able to communicate your perspective, then that review is valuable. And that's kind of hard to do sometimes because you don't obviously want to just say, I like these games every time you yeah. make a review. But, so you, but you can kind of find ways to um, sprinkle it into what you're saying in a way that, that, that's organic and natural. But um, another topic that I wanted to talk about in re relation to this like dev consumer gap is... Um, on mm. the perspective of something that consumers just have no appreciation for, and something that I certainly didn't until recently working for Stardock, is um, how important engines are and engine limitations. And mm. and even more than that, just programmer time and programmer effort. The, the things from the outside that may seem really, really simple, like, oh, why don't you just do this? Like, well, because that would take a programmer like a week to do. Um and that, that really determines a lot of the way that um, mechanics are designed and and systems are designed. Uh, and people, I think, have this this perception that everything in a game is very, very deliberate. When actually a lot of times the, the gameplay mechanics and the gameplay design is a compromise when they had th yeah. this really cool idea, but they didn't have, you know, maybe it's the budget, maybe it's the engine, maybe it's just the the programmer time when they realized how how intensive it was. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly aware of the things in Ashes that have changed since its initial conception to its its end product, but every game would be like that. No no end product of a game would actually look like the, the initial design because things just... Um, end up not being feasible or you know things come up along the way yeah i would i would agree with that i mean i think so i, I have a degree in game development i've made games i worked as a programmer for a game studio for six months and uh programmers are like the most like important thing for in my opinion for a game company and you can tell a lot by looking at the credits for a game and seeing how many programmers they have. Sometimes they've literally only like four or five and it could be like a $60 game. Or sometimes they've got like 20 or 30 and it's like, okay, like there's a dedicated team clearly for an engine here. Um, but yeah, engine engine, engine limitations are like a, it's it's just something that people don't really think about too much. And they, they can be changed. It's up to the company to change them, but it's just expensive to get programmers to spend their time on it. Everything in game development is calculated by man hours or woman hours or whatever, but man hours is what they call Person usually. hours is the yeah. the PC way. <laughs> Gen right. So these hours are then calculated against... Basically, all I ever did when I was in college learning about stuff like this is it's all about how can you best estimate your time and then, you know, judge how many tasks you can do in a given time frame. It's like, okay, well, we have enough money to pay a programmer or a group of programmers, whatever, for two years to work on something. Let's get them to completely outline everything they think they can do in terms of tasks and then get them to get to work on it. And then that that's called a burn down. You just burn down towards your, you know, your zero point release date, hopefully, and you hopefully get everything done by then. And often games will release when they know they haven't hit their zero because that's the date they committed to and they didn't estimate correctly. Or if it's a really good producer in charge, they'll overestimate correctly. And uh, if things go smoothly, I guess it's not always just down to the producer, but if things go smoothly, then they can like even have more time to fix things or do things that they didn't anticipate. So yeah, I think something that's, it's, you're right with like something people don't realize is it's just people making it and they have a certain time limit, you know, it's a nine to five job for a lot of people and then they go home and they, they can't like work on, they can't just radically change something that will deeply affect 
the engine or, or whatever and there's, there's limitations that they need to work on i think every game company should have a dedicated engine team it would just be quite expensive to programmers are the most expensive people to have i would have always thought artists actually but it's amazing how many people are actually really good at art whereas programming is like a refined skill that you have to learn from the from complete scratch whereas some people are just like creative by nature i guess well programming is it's also you want to ha you want to keep programmers you, you artists mm. can can come and go uh and it's, it's obviously valuable keeping them because then they're familiar with the art style of the game and, and so yeah. forth but a programmer who understands the way that a game is coded and and the way that the specific engine is coded is, is very valuable to keep yeah because if you people often think like oh with PUBG, just hiring like you know 50 programmers and just get to work it actually takes like months <laughs> to really learn the code base and figure out like how things works especially yeah. when there's you know, you're working with everyone else's code. You have to learn how they write. It's all, it's all just, it's very awkward because <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. it is like I call the language for a reason. Like people do write it differently. And then there's kind of, um, kind of rule sets that people go by that they try to all have like kind of unified code. And then you might need to read what someone read, how they do their thing and kind of copy them and then learn how the engine works. Cause then if you just hire in a bunch of people, that's how you get what's called spaghetti code, I guess where you'll do something and it creates a change like really far off somewhere else because you weren't aware of like what you're really interacting with. Uh, so it's a, di it's a difficult job. I don't, you know, programmers have a, t a really difficult job. It's just constantly daily problem solving. It's like really difficult. Um, it's like, I'm not even, I'm not very good at it, but um, they, yeah, because of that, it's just, it's just fundamentally, it's such a hard thing to change. And when people just assume like, oh, just make this work a different way. That's it's even if it's a day or two days time, they're getting paid for that. That takes that pushes that burn down like further back from the release or from their planned patch update or whatever it is. Um, so mm -hmm. it's never that easy. But you can tell like when when things are being balanced, updated, when it's just balanced patches. That's typically data entry and and some very small teams are left on games when like company appears. I don't know, but I would imagine there's only like four or five people even like uh, really there's, keeping. There's Kyle, the community manager, and I think yeah. he, even that. I mean, Coke Coke Two is currently balanced by community members. Which, I mean, yeah. and they're doing great work, but they obviously have a lot of issues. Um, but still, yeah. ironically, they're actually doing a lot better than I would argue Relic were in their prime. So kudos to those guys. And they're, you know, doing yeah. a volunteer. So I, I feel for them. I was, I, think, yeah, I was initially just having like a, part sorry, of the, go on. I, I was initially oh, right. part of the balance team, but I stopped because I moved, worked for Stardock. Yeah, well, you might suggest balances and stuff, but I don't doubt you were like actually implementing the... You know, you weren't doing it in the database, were you? Well, we were doing it in mods, and yeah, yeah but it right. wasn't actually on on the interface. So but... I'd say like there's a, a team there, a small hangover team of just like three to four or five maybe people that will then implement the community feedback and stuff like that, and work mm -hmm. on stuff. But I doubt there's like one programmer working on it. You know, I, I yeah, can't there imagine be. there is. That's what um, I'm doing for Ashes. Some is... UI stuff changes every now and then, so they might have a little bit of time allocated for that oh like artists yeah they're making new icon for something but yeah that's what i do ashes is i'm doing you know the data entry like scenarios maps and, and these are all files that i'm editing or, or making and it's mm. it's not exactly it's not game code it's yep. the the scenarios are done with code but it's not like the raw c plus plus game code it's like an xml it's scripting yeah scripting yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and and the map oh, well, is like xml is still just kind of like data entry and database entry scripting will be more like kind of like code but not quite and then you've got your like actual code that's going to like affect things quite it's, it's in an, a dot xml file and but there's this pre-made uh like terms and such so someone mm -hmm. has come along before and and made it a lot easier than like raw code right yeah but but, but either way there's 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 I see kind of two interesting strategies here for for developers at least. Um, there's like the the paradox way. As an, I'm not like I'm not that much in, that much into paradox games, but as I understand, they have like one engine, right? The the Clausewitz engine or something. Yeah. And they don't need so to work on it too much because it's it's not that graphical. Their, their mm -hmm. games are not that graphically heavy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so you can you can you don't have to improve the the engine every time you or make a new engine or something because you can just put out a lot of content in the same in the same uh, with the same graphics as before because of their modular content policy and all that and then there's the startup strategy that of course uh, I abide to because I work there but with they they have these heavy 
investments and engines and that means that they can have games that look uh, radically different like the new star control origins that's coming out that's so so different from everything we've seen but it just the investment is so heavy and um you can't put out content all the time like like paradox is doing because there's so much investment mm -hmm. i don't know which is better uh, but it's just very different strategies well the, the engine is certainly a, a long-term investment because yeah uh, rts games have become very stagnant and you know there, there's there's a lot of reasons why that has been but certainly part of it is, is engine limitations and while uh, like fps games mm. generally just use unity or unreal uh, rts games there there isn't there hasn't really been good engines um, which has you know resulted in you know unit caps remaining quite low um, performance problems like I, I played the alpha of um, of the command and conquer generals 2 where when that was in alpha and I'm pretty sure the reason why it was scrapped is because the frostbite engine just was not suited for RTS they yeah. were and they, they went over budget and then they were initially um, going to scrap it but then they didn't because they were like oh well if we do if we do free to play then we can cut out development costs because we don't have to make single player um, but then it, it's still they they couldn't go over budget um, they couldn't go, go keep the budget schedule because yeah the frostbite was just not working and and like when actually playing the alpha the unit responsiveness was was really bad the way that units parved it around was really bad it, it was it, it seemed like the problem really was just under the hood just yeah. programming stuff um and you know that's the great thing about stardock is is we have this first um the core neutral engine which moving forward allows us to you know make games that can have thousands of units can can render these like really huge battles and stuff whereas if you look at the fidelity of rts games like if you compare company of heroes one to company of heroes two it that, that it doesn't really look any better than you were one um you know it does a little yeah. bit but mm -hmm. not not much and you could argue mm -hmm. it's for budget reasons which i'm sure the budget was much smaller in co2 but a lot of it is just because cpu core speed hasn't exactly increased um, not by much, but it's the it's the, the the core, the number of cores, and the hyper threading that's increasing. But you know, en engines can't really make use of it properly, and so with with Stardock now that we have this core neutral engine, we can we can really take um, you know RTS games forward. But the thing is with that is is the engine was such an investment that, um, say like Ashes, it didn't have as much budget going into it as something like um say supreme commander but now that we have this this engine in like we can every game we make moving forward whether it's star control or origins whether it's a sequel to ashes or whatever it is not confirming or mm. denying that um we, we have all this powerful hardware under the hood that we can just focus on the gameplay and not have to think about how the engine would compromise the gameplay I guess that's the 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 good thing about being both a software company and a games company like like Stardock. But not yeah. many companies have that. Uh, no, yeah. I had to I throw in a engine... Stardock plug because you've been talking about Paradox too much, so I had to offset it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think um, <laughs> engine developments are just like super underrated. Well, it, I think it's they're not used that much, or engine investment isn't isn't something that happens too often because it's just so expensive. It's expensive to create your own engine. And then to be, you have to maintain it, but the investment is usually super worthwhile because you can multi, um, you can use it then for multiple games going forward, and you know you own all the licenses to it. And eventually, if you make a really good one, you can even license it out if you if you wanted to do that. So, like Paradox have made, they're a publisher as well as a developer, and they are very systems orientated and, and programming orientated. And they just made their own engine. They don't make many changes to it now, but. That's the foundation for multiple games that they have. So they're getting yeah. their money back every time they release any content on that engine. Uh, the same goes for Creative Assembly made this new engine for their game back in, I think, 2008 or something when Empire Total War came out. And it hasn't changed too much since then. They've made like four or five games on top of it, all yeah. the DLC. Like any money that they felt, oh, God, we're sinking a lot of money into this, you know, they've easily, I'm sure, by now gotten back 10 times over. Um, but they keep they keep making like uh, they keep selling really really well, so they don't really probably feel the need to change their engine at this point. They probably think it's fine. Don't need to do too, anything too crazy with it. And then EA 
have frostbite and they're trying to like shove that into every studio they have because it's like this is a pretty flexible engine it takes a while to learn it's I a marketing to... thing as well like look frostbite yeah. yeah well that's it is yeah but, but frostbite like runs so well and it's that has a dedicated big team on it just making updates so does yeah. unreal and so does like all these cry uh, crytex engine or cry engine these engines are like super powerful and then unity is like obviously a free one you can use and distribute and license everywhere so engine engine development super expensive to do but it i i've never seen it like i mean maybe just because i don't know but i've never really seen it fail when you know when it's in one of the hands of a big company well both um, both supreme commander one and company Heroes one were not profitable on launch um and you know thq yeah. ended up collapsing and they published both of those and perhaps they'd paid itself off after all the expansions and so forth but mm -hmm. um it, it's it's sort of sad in that sense that thq funding yeah. these these huge big budget games went under but um that, that's that's sort of the the advantage of the the, the company like stardock where it's both a publisher and a developer it means that we can have the 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 foresight and the long-term thinking whereas if you have a a developer and a publisher that are separate which is you know almost all companies mm. yeah it's more of a transactional relationship in terms of it's like a per project where we're concerned yeah. about this one game needs to be profitable. And then if this one game is profitable, great, then we can secure the next contract and then we'll make yeah. this game. And if that's profitable, then we can do the next one. So that's sort of that long term thinking of, um, you know, engine isn't isn't important for them but what they're more concerned about is just yeah. making this one game profitable um you know and successful coming back coming back on 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 topic i think that that divide between gamers and critics and, and studios i think that these things like the development of engines and all these things these, these should be like visible to people following the studio, you know, like you could like engines and this kind of, thing, it doesn't need to be something that you do and then you sell the game afterwards. I mean, you could, you could show it off and, and even though it's buggy and, and all these things, like if you have the, these, um, I don't know, development diaries or whatever inside the studio, I mean, it's just, it's just my idea of what a, a game developer can be. You can tell the stories of, of the engines and the games while they're being developed and not just afterwards, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think m more companies should do that. I mean, everything I've learned about game development since being in either college or at a games company, I mean, super fascinating. It just gives you more insight into, I haven't learned anything that I, that I wouldn't, shouldn't be able to say here. You know, it's nothing crazy that goes on. I don't know why they don't talk about it more. It's just, it's just yeah. people working on computers, making a game with some interesting software. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why companies are so adverse to talking about the process and, and how much goes into it, how much time it takes to do even like the simplest things. Um, mm. It would give everybody a greater perspective on it, I think. So, yeah, it probably probably would be a good thing to do. Some companies do do it, like they have dev diaries. And like you said, like we said much earlier, you know, they're starting to show off games a little bit b more before they're ready and things like that. And that's, again, not to harp on about Paradox over and over again, but they do dev diaries. I don't Start even like does dev diaries. that much. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Callum does um, dev diaries. They, they yeah. do a dev diary for every game they have every week, I think. And uh, yeah, they, do. they yeah. go super in detail and just show stuff like, yeah, I don't I don't read them. There's actually too many of them for me to keep up with. But a week seems a bit excessive, though. Do. Like, I wouldn't be able to come up with everything for a week. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> they, they've got a different topic every week. I don't, I don't know why or how they it's manage it, but studio, they do. Right, yeah. Yeah, well, Paradox is like, they're a publisher, they have multiple games, but I know just, I follow Stellaris, that's why I keep bringing up Paradox, it's really the only game I play from them, and they've mm. got a big update coming up, and they've got, they just hit Dev Diary 100, you know, that, that is one a week since the game came out, it came out in 2016, um, and each one is pretty interesting, they have screenshots, and they talk, you know, it's only maybe just a, a you know, two A4 pages, it's not crazy, it's pretty easy read, and there's some screenshots about what they're working on, and it's just nice to have that insight, and like, Oh, they're working on this, and there's always a few jokes like we encountered this problem or this bug, and blah blah blah. Yeah, That's I really guess cool if, if it's actively in development, then it would be pretty yeah. easy to do that. Whereas what I do with with Ashes, it, the, the game's already out, and and we're working on mm. you know new content and and DLCs, improvements and such. But it's not as the development would be would is a lot slower than something that's like, say, Star Control Origins, that's like full in development. Yeah. 
I guess the problem is a lot of games will have features that might end up getting cut and you don't want to end up talking about something and it doesn't make it in because that just one even though it's just a reality of game development kind of makes your studio look like we couldn't do it and then two it's like maybe some community got really hyped for that thing pre-ordered and then they're like oh it's not actually in the game so yeah i could see Mm -hmm. why that those kind of things might be issues but if you know it's going in for sure somehow Mm. i think the transparency is is more important and you just got to word things in a certain way that's like we're thinking about this this is what we're working on rather than saying this is coming because you know occasionally we'll have people that are like hey so when are we getting the galaxy map it's like oh that's not happening anymore it's something that we talked about last year yeah Yeah. maybe you know kind of i I kind of disagree with you a little bit, Darren, because, of course, yeah, you have to uh, think about company secrets, industry secrets, and new games coming up and all that. But even showing people a feature that's not in the final game, if you actively tell people, oh, we had to cut it because this and this, you actually kind of build trust, you know, even though it's... I would, I would yeah. agree with you. I was I was more framing it as in like that's I would imagine why or the mm. marketing reasons why they might do it. But if yeah, if I was doing a company or if I had a company, I feel like I would be quite transparent about pretty much everything. I'd be like, look, we tr- we tried this feature. It doesn't work gameplay wise. You know, it actually just doesn't work, or we yeah. don't have the time for it, or whatever. I'd I'd be fine with saying that. And like you said, I just frame it as in like these are dev diaries. Some features may or may not make it into the game. If you want to see mm. things that do make it, like our, we are planning on adding, you know, check this feature list and, yeah. you know, check our actual trailers and stuff for our gameplay breakdowns. Like this is a, de- a developer diary. We're trying things back and forth. So I agree mm. with you. Builds trust, super transparent. It's really nice to see. And it, bu- it does build this community and they want to get involved with the development of the game, mm. even if it's just like keeping an eye on it every now and then. So I think I a, a lot of companies will be led by people who aren't gamers themselves so say you'll have a company that's founded and then the, the person who founded it is a really passionate gamer but then 10 yeah. 15 years later some company comes along and says we'll buy your company for 50 million dollars and he's like hell yeah and then you end up yeah. getting a bunch of like corporate suits running a company and then they, they, they don't have this appreciation and this understanding of like what it actually is like to be a gamer and what gamers want um, there's something that I really enjoy about Stardock is that like Brad is the mm. original founder of Stardock and he's been yeah. there since mm. the the 90s, um, and and he's you know he will do he does programming he will do like streams of Galsiv and and he 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 gets excited about things and he'll say things on forums and stuff that you can tell that he's just doing it because he wants to not just like yeah, calculated awesome. uh, you know top down decision that's been made to increase profit mm-hmm. in some like way like you know it'd be a lot harder to convince the ceo of ea that we should do weekly dev diaries compared to like yep. a a smaller company mm. that's run mm. by well if it if it works you know if it if, if you can show him that it ha- gives results yeah. you can probably convince the ceo of, of ea but but the problem is that he wouldn't do it in the first place you well know, you wouldn't be, be able to like... convince him what the results are like how how can you yeah. correlate the sales with with that yeah. well, rather than we put out a dev diary and then our pre-orders spiked that day and then they'd be like mm, oh okay yeah. let's do it but, but yeah. the problem is that you have that to show happens. results <laughs> first right yeah. and so so you you always come in second with that kind of approach and, and and i think really think that it's true that you need an organizational culture like a game company culture that supports this kind of process so so a, co- a company that actively tries to learn right so, so every time you see a bug or something, it's kind of perceived as a learning opportunity. And that's what you tell your community that, oh, we learned this and this, and now we did that and we had to cut that because, um, but, it, but many companies does not work like that. It's, it's more perceived as a failure of, of the company. So it's all about the company's own culture. And I think the community will reflect that, uh, what the company stands for, is my opinion. Yeah. So another little topic shift. Something that um, that I like, that I enjoy looking out for, is when things in in games are designed and marketed in a way, but f- when you sort of look at it critically, you, you realize that it's done for budget. And you can even expand this out further than just video games. So say uh, in Star Wars. Um, 
The Force Awakens, how Han Solo dies at the end. The thing is, is, is even if Spoilers. the directors and the... I mean, it's, it's, it's an old movie. Even if they wanted Han Solo to be in the next Star Wars movie, they wouldn't have because like the, the amount of money they had to pay Harrison Ford is just absurd. And I'm also going to spoil the Last Jedi. It's you know it's been a few weeks. You know Luke's Jesus. died at the end, uh, and you know again if you look at the the budgeting of uh, what's his name Mark Hamill, he 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 basically his his budget was pretty much that of the like all the other actors combined apart from um, Carrie Fisher. And so you think like, did they actually want to kill Luke off, or did they did they have to? Was it a requirement that they kill Luke off because yeah. his he was too expensive? And and you look at games in the same way. Is so an example that I like to use is, you know, in, in Dawn of War three they didn't have sync kills. In Dawn of War one and two, though the animations that play at the end of like a, a melee combat where there's some fancy animation that looks really sick. And then in Dawn of War 3, they say, oh, we, we removed that because, you know, it's not good for competitive play because then players don't have the ability to control their units while those animations occur. And, like, you know, that's fair enough. That's, that, that's true. But realistically, that was probably never on the table to begin with because the animation cost of giving sync kills to all of these units um, is just you know, too expensive. And in Dow 3, it seemed like it had a really low budget. It only had three factions. Dawn of War 2 and Dawn of War 1 launched with four factions. And then they, they were like, oh, well, we're only doing three factions, so we can really focus on making them as you know yeah. in-depth as they can. But again, it was probably only for budget reasons. So that's something that, that I think consumers don't really, aren't sort of skeptical of enough that there should be, is, is like when, when, when things are presented in a certain way, they should think a bit more critically and be like, okay, is that true? Or are you just saying that because it would be too expensive to do anything otherwise? Yeah, I, I can't go too in depth about specifics, but that's exactly what happens all the time. It's like in, in the marketing department, it's like, you know, you've something, you basically make a list of like, what are all the kind of negatives that we have to talk about, right? That people are going to find out either before the game comes out or as it comes out. Yeah. You make that list and then you go through, well, how can we, like, <laughs> what's the best way to talk about these things and how can we spin it in a way that's not not too bad? Um, there's multiple features because I was, like, such a big fan of the game that I worked on. I went to my marketing director and I was like, oh, people are going to take this pretty badly or th this really badly, not realizing that he was then going to be like, I, I thought I could, I don't know, I, I thought maybe that I ended up getting into a big design discussion with, like, a load of, high up designers and they were kind of like debating what they could do about it it's kind of like well this game's out pretty soon it's a bit too late to change some of these things most of them actually and then it was like okay so my marketing boss went away and he was like right we need to come up with ways that we can then talk about them to the community and spin it and get a out ahead of the message if they start saying like it's bad they they you know they take initiative whereas if we come out and tell them about it first it's not so bad so it's the exact thing where it's just like you're not lying necessarily but you are getting out it's ahead of the spin. message saying like, yeah. hey, we decided that our sieges or whatever the thing is aren't going to be like fully surroundable. They used to be surroundable in all the other games, but this time we've decided to improve the AI. And the AI will work much better on these new types of cities where you can only attack one wall. And everyone's like, oh, fucking hell, yes, great AI. That's what I want. I want great AI. AI great AI. And then it's like two months after the game comes out, at least if you're included into Total War Warhammer, everyone hates the sieges because they're super dull and repetitive. You just attack one wall over and over. And you used to be able to like surround the city and think about what you need to do. So that was like the case example. in Age of Wonders 3. In the Age yeah, of Wonders so, 2, yeah. you used to be able to go it's, all around. It's like, and I, I felt bad because I was like, God damn it, I actually caused that to happen <laughs> or a few, in a few instances. Whereas if I didn't say anything, the community might have gotten all angry and maybe once someone would have been forced to change something. And I was like, God damn it. Um, so yeah, it, that happens like all the time and I, I, I hate it. It's, if you ever see a feature that's in a game, that's not in another game, chances are it's just, they have a smaller budget and they have to cut it because of that. That's, that's pretty much like always the reason. Um, especially if the engine is the same and the, you know, the releases are like, it's only like two years since the previous release. There is no reason that they haven't just kept it over. It's animations, like you said, might cost too much. They did put in like heroes or whatever, and there was like animations between them. So maybe they thought, Oh, uh, you know, we'll put the animations on these things. 
these animations there's less of them but we can at least say well the work went into the you know the big characters fighting we took it out for the competitive aspect on the ground um, but you still have animations over here secretly behind the scenes i'm sure that costs way less to do it that way and but yeah but their game failed so sucks to be them so yeah i don't know yeah and it's you 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 would just intuitively assume that a sequel would have more budget than the original game but that yeah, is often not the case. the case basically you make a product and you say like hey it costs us like one mi just for i know this isn't nearly the amount it would cost but it costs hey it costs us one million to make this game we made two million from the game isn't this great and then then your publisher or whoever will say, someone at the top of the company will say, okay, now do that again, but this time we'll give you 900,000. Do it again. Yeah. And then they'll get 900,000 and try to do it again. Because you're always trying to just reduce the cost and increase the profit until you hit the sweet spot of like, you are maximizing the amount of money you can make on the thing you're selling. And mm. it's always gonna be just like a marketing message on how you spin that. You know, whether it's you're cutting features, but you're like, oh, like there's design reasons for this, blah, blah, blah. It's all lies <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. It's basically just we're cutting stuff to make it cheaper to make and we're going to keep it the same price or increase the price, especially when it comes to DLC and just like take the money and, and we're more successful for it. That's how a company operates. They don't necessarily think like how it affects the end user too much. And uh yeah, it's, I don't know, it makes me sick. That's pretty much like why I left, just because of that happening over and over to extremes. Um, I mean, sometimes yeah. it's necessary, though. Like, if you... Sometimes. A lot of times you'll see indie developers get a huge Kickstarter, but then they, they just yeah. don't have that um, fiscal responsibility, and then they just end up blowing, you know, a $10 million budget yeah. because they can't manage <laughs> themselves. So publishers get a planning, dirty yeah. name. And, you know, I think, you know, in many cases it's justified, like cough loot boxes. But, um, you know, in other cases, I think it's it's sort of a necessary evil. Like somebody ha is taking a financial risk to fund this game. And yeah. I, I think a lot of times people are a bit too resentful towards publishers. But, uh, you know, a, and a lot of times it's justified too. A lot of people people just blame publishers and it's not always the publisher's fault. The company wants to look good in the eyes of the publisher as well. The company wants to be able to tell the publisher that they saved money and, you know, mm. cut their budget or increased their budget and made more money or whatever. It's not, you know, people always assume, and I'm not saying either way, I don't know it, what it's like at every company, but people always assume like, oh, the big bad publisher comes in, cuts all our funding and we have to make the hardest game ever like with no money. Often it's like the guy at the top of the company, the CEO, wants to be able to tell EA, hey, I did the game that you asked me to do with less money. And then he gets a nice big bonus because he did a really good job and everyone gets a big bonus at the company. So they're mm. they're all in it for themselves. Like money is such like a corrupting force for everybody that, you know, it's really alluring to try and like maximize, minimize your costs and maximize your profits, you know, whether it affects the game or not. Not all companies are like that. Privately owned companies seem to be the ones that doesn't matter as long as you're turning a profit the people are usually happy and they keep striving to make good stuff to make more money mm -hmm. whereas publishers and and public companies seem to like focus more on it's just a profit profit cost like mm -hmm. exchange that we got to figure out um i would agree with you that like yeah publishers do get like a really bad rap but um i don't know i'm to lose my train of thought now as well you had you said something earlier that i was trying to think about well i'll i'll say that something doesn't matter. you're Go thinking um yeah, I, I remember you were saying in your AMA that there was a lot of like office politics that you you really couldn't stand, and and you said it's yeah. it's a huge company, right? Like there's 200 staff working at 540. 500, geez, that's that's huge. That's yeah, huge. and 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 I, I've heard was, from a lot it was of like other 380 when I started or something. So right, a, yeah. a lot of other devs that have, have that are, are working. Um, at Starbuck, but have worked at other bigger companies is like the bigger the company is generally it's, it's a lot less fun to work there because you're more in this um, assembly line in terms of like you're you're very limited in what you're doing you know this is this is all that you're doing this one thing and then you have like different departments that are very detached from each other and then they don't really mm -hmm. see the whole picture especially the top down you know the upper management that doesn't really have the appreciation of the game where um i guess to once again praise stardock is it's it's i mean there's about 50 people in the office and there's about 50 people remote i mean that may be wrong but that's at least what i'm aware of lately 
And so at the office when I was there, only for a couple of weeks, so I work from home in Australia um, until I get my visa. Um, it was it was very like a, it was a nice friendly community, and I, and I think any small office would be like that because everyone sees everyone, everyone kind of knows what everyone's doing. Mm. You have, um, you know, the management that actually cares about what the end product is and will play it and will stream it and such. So I think, yeah, not all companies would be the same to work for. Um, and I think it would be a, a pretty general trend that the bigger the company gets, it, would be, it wouldn't be as fun for the, the staff. Yeah. Unless, unless you, have, you work in kind of a culture to negate that or like I talked about kind of a learning culture, right? It's, it's, it's all in the company culture because you can have a big company that still has the mindset of a small company, right? Like it's possible and you've seen that before. Um, yeah, one of the things I like about Riot is I believe all of their staff actively play League of Legends, maybe apart from their their accountants or something. Uh, and and when you <laughs> when you look at their job applications, and, I, and I've applied for a couple of jobs like years ago, they say like you know we really hope you have a level thirty account, like we we, we want to make sure you play <laughs> League regularly. So I, I like that culture of like they really value people who actively play League of Legends at Riot. Yeah. Um, when when I was talking about office politics, I guess, at least for me, I, I would agree that probably the bigger the company, the more almost competitive it is as well. So it's probably difficult to, to get along with people and detached to different departments are. Um, the one I worked at was actually pretty friendly in, in, in general. Like I, I, we were on the same floor as like programmers and designers and stuff. We weren't like super detached and everything was, we we're all in the same building. It was, it was kind of fine. But um, it was more the nature of some people will do will do anything to get like to get ahead even at the expense of like the game or the, doing what's right at least what i feel is right um and that would just really suck it's like you know we're supposed to do something a certain way and you choose not to do that because of your own self interest and things like that so i don't know if that's because it's a big company or if those types of people are like just always exist um but that's something I found because necess because not everyone necessarily cared about the product the way I did. I was a bit of a special case, I guess, for good or for bad. Um, other people might be like, yeah, well, screw it. Like, who cares if this thing doesn't make it in or if we don't get this thing out on time? It doesn't really matter to that person because they're not as invested as I guess I was. And uh, it's just and it wasn't always to do with me. It was, sometimes you just see it going on between other people. And it's just like, I just really didn't like that. And when I worked at an, I worked at an indie company before as a programmer, there was like eight of us and we were like super friendly. Everyone was so nice and everyone helps each other figure out stuff. And we all go out to lunch together. And I imagine it's kind of similar when you're even like 50 to a hundred people, you know, mm. everybody, you know, everyone to see them, you know what everyone's kind of roughly doing. You go out with a few of them to get lunch or, or whatever you do. Um, so yeah, I that was just the, something that the science the science says about you can have a support kind of fifty people in a tribe. Oh no, yeah, isn't isn't like one hundred and fifty or like or one hundred and fifty? Yeah, like yeah. the uh, and that's the way that the the Roman legions were sized after the, and like <laughs> certain military platoons or not platoon, but yeah, the, the, is it, is it Dun Dunbar's number? Isn't that what it's the like phenomena is called? What it's called, but. One of the really high ups wrote about he he's awesome. He say he's been there for like fifteen years or something, and he wrote about how the company gets bigger over time. And then he start he's like, oh, now I remember reading an old email from him where it's like we've just reached the point now where we'll stop recognizing people, like you know, or we start seeing people we don't recognize. And he was mm -hmm. talking about how to deal with that and stuff. So they're very aware of it, and they try to maintain this like really small company culture and stuff. And I think most companies probably do. Well, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of companies that started small do strive for that. But at a certain point, when you're like that company's 550 employees now, they're now in two separate buildings at this point. Um, mm. You know, they're going to see people they don't recognize. Things are going to there's going to be conflicts between. There's almost a competitive aspect actually, which is probably healthy mm. between the two buildings. Um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of what I was talking about with office politics. Anyway, it's just a shame to see people like not care about the product. I guess just to get ahead for their own personal gain, or even if they're just. I don't know, just seemingly being an asshole that day. It's like you're not even benefiting, but you're like slowing everything else down purposefully. It's just kind of annoying, but yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So, um, you know what? <laughs> well, so one other topic that I that I had in mind, I guess we can end it at that. We were planning on talking about RTS. 
uh, as well. But at, th- at that stage, I think we'll have to leave that for another day if we end up doing another one. Um, okay. So the, the position that I am at Stardock, which is, I think, pretty unique in terms of like what companies do it. It's, it's called um, like game designer slash product manager. So I alluded to it briefly at the start where I do a lot of the developer um, like designer interaction where I'm, you know, coming up with like what new units to make, uh, what new maps to make and, and implementing balance changes and such. But I'm also doing marketing content as well. So I'm like the person that made the, the little showcase for the new DLC that came out. Um, and I also made all those DLCs and then I'm also like a community manager. And so, but what I think that does though, why I think it's a really good position that we have that same position for other products like off or trading company, um, Zolta by, uh, what's his name? Michael Califf, I think is, is that it, I think it creates a bit of transparency and a bit of trust when you have a, like the same person who actually physically made this this scenario and designed this unit then is also the person telling you about this unit and this scenario and and whatnot i think that makes people kind of respect it a bit more like in my videos i always sign off i'm like hey i'm callum mccall lead designer for ashes escalation and i think that is a lot nicer than sort of having this this faceless nameless marketing guy reading a voiceover um and I mean, I guess I'm fortunate. I think I have a pretty good like voiceover voice where not every designer would have that. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I think that's a really cool initiative that we have at Stardock. Uh, yeah, so I think I was saying earlier, like I think it's always good to have developers on. And I, if, if it was my company and I was making a game, I would want to be the one that tells everyone about it. Like I'm fairly confident in how I speak. The, the problem is I guess some some developers and other people might just not be as socially, um, they might be more socially awkward or might have find it hard. Yeah, having in front of a camera like doing YouTube like for so long, you, you sort of, you yeah. just, you learn. Like I used to be extremely shy when I was in college. I never would have imagined that I would, I would be on a podcast or put my face on, on the internet. I wanted to be completely faceless until I had to join Creative Assembly and they made me do it. <laughs> um, but I'm glad they did because I became way more confident over time with that anyway. Um, so yeah, like I think I think that's I like I, I used to always argue the point like, which my uh, my colleagues would hate. It's like I almost felt like there was no need for a community team if the designers could just do it, but them really wanting their job, I guess they would disagree with that. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's like government bureaucracy in a nutshell, right? Yeah, so it's just like exactly they they're just fighting their own corner. I I was perfectly willing to give up my job, for the betterment of the marketing arm or even the betterment of the game. You know, it's just, I don't care. I just care about the game um, and how it's portrayed. But uh, other people wouldn't see it that way. It's like they, they're they needed no matter what, apparently. Um, anyway, it probably comes across as I'm being real petty there, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter anyway. Um, but yeah, so if it was my company, I'd just be like, I want to be the one that tells people about it. And if I had a big company where I had multiple designers, I'd be like, all right, if you're a designer and you're making something, you're going to have to tell people about it. And we're going to train you as best as we can to do that if you want. Or if you're, if you're a bit shy on camera, we'll get you doing it regularly and you'll get better and you'll just get better and you'll be fine with it. And I think it also gives that person a level of personal responsibility as well, where they don't want to make bad stuff because they know that they're going to be held more accountable to it from the community. But when they do make great things, they'll, they'll get elevated on Twitter, or on YouTube or whatever to this status where people will follow them even if they leave the company because they make good stuff. So I think it's in everyone's interest that the designer steps forward and says, hey, I made this. This is what I was thinking. This is you know the plan. And then also not just designers, but it's always good to highlight everybody's work. Artists and programmers go completely like pretty much unnamed all the time, apart from like credits, obviously, but you don't know who made the model or who made the thing. And often you just expect models to look good, but it's like someone really creative actually like spent a lot of time working on that and that animation and, and that stuff. And it's, it's always really interesting to see, like I'm not into animation or art, but it's, I always find it fascinating when I see people create it. It's like, holy crap, how can you just do that by looking at a screen? Like it's insane. Um, so if I was doing marketing, that's, I would always push that human aspect way more than I would have any faceless, like press releases or top down, like executive orders that are coming through about like, these are our features. These are bullet points. I'm super excited. 
get on board the hype train, pre-order now and all that stuff. Like it is a business and that's important, but there are other ways to do business and that more human face really help. It really works with me, I guess. Is yeah. What I'm and yeah. You, you need to have like actual experienced marketing people that are giving you feedback and advice and have a strategy. But Second. I think the, the raw the content um, is best. Is, it's, it's best if it's made by the, the designer. Um, a Sam you just walked away because I was going to say that the human aspect is something that Melf has been trying to do with his his I guess video essays you can call them. Um, yeah. He here he is. I'll, I guess I'll let him talk about it when he's back on. Uh, Melf, I was just going to ask you to sort of expand yes. upon like how you've been trying to do the human element of your start off videos. Yeah, definitely. I I I um, the thing about. Uh, I definitely agree with you, Darren, that um, I th also think the designer should be the ones portraying the product. And just what I've experienced from doing this kind of video essay style and uh, of the strategy visions, uh, I call that series, from f for Stardock, is that when you talk with programmers and, and other people, they're just really excited to talk about what they do, right? It's just, it's just it's a thing they think about all day. So <laughs> you don't get forced excitement, you get real excitement. Yeah, real you know? excitement. And they're yeah. really proud about what they make. Instead of, like we were saying earlier, someone comes in, doesn't quite know everything, mm. and then it's like, this is amazing, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And if you know them, you check their Steam account, it's like one hour or something <laughs> in the game. It's like, okay, great. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's the way to go if you want to get like authentic uh, marketing, you know, like, yeah, that's that's just my thoughts about on that, yeah. Well, I, I was I also going to teams can still I was just really going to quickly say I think marketing teams still have a place like you said to train up those designers yeah, or like teach them the yeah. best practices and then bigger picture stuff like dealing with trailers and pushing out to the masses, you know. Like that's what marketing could be used for marketing teams, but I feel like yeah, the community team should almost just be I don't really know if there's a, too much need for a community team if you just have designers that are competent enough to be able to speak, um, which they kind of should be, I guess, in a way. Yeah, I, I, I guess there's also the scalability of it. Like, if if you have a 500 person company, you you won't have the time for a designer to do all that. But the the smaller the project, the easier it is to sort of mesh out. But um, like a good example is in the recent video that I was in that Melton made about AI in Ashes. Um, he made it quite goofy in terms of there was like little bloopers where I was like, "Hi, I'm Callum McCall, lead designer for Ashes of the Singularity." And then it sort of cut and it was like, oh, wait, I should say escalation because the marketing people get mad if I don't say it. Es escalation being the expansion. So then it would like do right, it again yeah. and it said, Ashes escalation. And then at the end, there was another little goof where I said something that sounded really silly. And then I was like, oh, that sounds really silly. And then he edited this like you know, explosion over that sort of fueling right. the fun. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I really like that from um, in that video, which I didn't think he was going to do at the time because he took all this um behind the scenes footage as it as it were and and put it in the video and what it does is it, it makes me seem a lot more human and normal rather than this yeah. like really scripted robotic like i'm really mm. eloquent i'm really professional and it's also self-aware of what like what's going on as well yeah yeah that's that's the important part and that's the kind of the philosophy behind oh. it that i think a lot of companies don't like to show their own meta, right? They don't like to show that something is going on and we make mistakes. And but that's what the community really likes is when you see personality and you see uh, kind of this meta layer of of like we can yeah. make mistakes or we can have fun or make jokes that aren't really funny, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, yeah. You call it humane, Callum, and yeah, yeah, it's a good way of of saying it, yeah. But it's also kind of um, how, how can I say like you can you can discuss things that are not uh, finished yet or you can you can have ideas on camera or something like that you know like it doesn't have to be that controlled an environment uh, yeah. people are also probably less likely to flame you and leave nasty YouTube comments if they realize like, oh this this person's real um, yeah. Yeah. So, something else that I that I found interesting is, so I'm very active on the Discord server that we have for Ashes, which is like it's an official server. And so all the time people are saying things and they're asking me things. 
uh, and and I'll respond. And generally, it's while I'm working or while I'm doing something. I'll just sort of look at it, read, and I'll just respond. And people will then like, oh no no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. This is what I meant. And I'm like, and they they sort of act as if like I've been offended. And it's because I respond in a and I talk in a very candid, concise way. And and people are used to developers and community managers and so forth being really like, hey, thanks for your feedback. We're looking into it really fluffy yeah, and really yeah, yeah. like overly nice. And and that always gave me the shits. I remember talking on, on forums in the the uh the generals to Alpha and you know, I was giving a lot of feedback because I had a lot of problems. Um and and then like the the people there or the EA community I, I don't know what they were exactly I don't think they were community managers because it was like a private forum um, but they were like you know hey thanks for your feedback and it was all like this nice we'll look at, you know and I just couldn't stand it. it it felt so fake and 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 the way that I talk and and the way that Brad talks as well on, on forums and things like you know we we're, we're busy we just want to say what we want to say and and even just I'll just if someone says something stupid they're like hey this unit's really overpowered you should nerf it I'm just like no you're wrong it's not counter of this <laughs> and like it it, yeah. it it may come across as being sort of like rude but it's it's only because you when you look at it through the lens of this is a developer they should act nice th- then it comes across as rude but that's just like how normal yeah. people talk and so I'll I will just talk to community people the same way that I will that I would have done had I not been a dev, and then people often freak out at that. Like I've had multiple people think that I've actually offended. I've they've been offended. I've been offended by them, and they'll have this like apology and they'll explain what they meant, and it's like it just gets weird. And so I I, I don't like that how devs uh, people just feel the need to act really unusual like they need to put on this persona mm. yeah i mean i don't know i don't know what the reason i well, like i guess that's just the the kind of the way they've been led to believe that they should act i suppose but yeah i, d- I agree i don't think they need to act that way i know a few live streams and developers that that do act that don't act that way and it's it's super refreshing to see because they're like they'll, they'll get yeah. chat where people are asking them questions or even just when a dev speaks really authoritatively on something, it's like, no, I've actually thought about what you're saying, and it's like, that's not true. Yeah, it's I did that. Right. Yeah, I've, I've thought wrong. about it, and you're wrong yeah. on that one. So, um, you know, people are like, oh, it'd be cool if you added this thing or this thing, or, you know, this unit should have this ability, and, and blah blah. It's like, no, we tried that, doesn't work actually. You're you're wrong. Sorry, <laughs> but you know, that's it's good to it's kind of good to hear. Instead of like, oh yeah, I'll think about it. Like we'll we'll see, we'll see about doing that. Blah blah blah. Trying to be all nice all the time. It just I don't know. It doesn't work for me anyway. Well, I think we're out of talking points. Unless you guys had um, anything else, then I'm happy to wrap it up. It's been it's been almost two hours now, so that's a good podcast. Mm. Uh, no, I don't yeah. think I've got anything. Yeah, it was a good talk. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, follow these guys on Twitter. There is the the at link on the screen. It's been a really fun talk. I um I always enjoy talking to Melter when I have the chance, and and Darren, it's been it's been a blast. I think. Yeah, it's been um, really nice meeting you guys. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to talk about RTS another time. We didn't even get to that, but that's yeah. it. Subscribe to the channel for more RTS content and discussions and so forth. If you if you want to check out Darren's reviews, I guess he does a lot more reviews than I do. I normally only follow particular games. Uh, then his channel is there, and I guess Malta doesn't really have his own channel. He just does Starbucks stuff now. <laughs> yeah, yeah basically. All right. Thanks for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.